Good morning, all. It's so great to see so many of you here today. My name's Ed Purvis. I'm Head of Collection Services for the NPG. And on behalf of the Director, may I extend a warm welcome to you all. And we're absolutely delighted and thrilled to host today. It's also my pleasure to welcome to the newly reopened gallery back in June. And I hope it will be a chance for you to see the new spaces, especially for those who have not been since 2019 pre-COVID. And I'd also like to thank the Bur Burlington and the Chair and Board of London Arts Week for inviting me to speak at the event today. We're not expecting a fire alarm, um, but if we do have one, it's real, so the nearest exit's over there, or if you're sat at the back, it's back out the way that you came in. I can see that we are in for a real treat today in terms of the talks, and I actually think it's the first time we've met in person since 2019, since COVID, so it's great to have us all here today. We have a, th a thrilling set of speakers, and a huge thank thanks to them and the mod moderators as well. I can see the agenda is packed, and it's threefold. So we're going to kick off with paintings and look how te technology can help us undo past mis mistakes and look to the future. We're then going to have a fascinating look at the his history of conservation and how partic particularly women have shaped the study. And at the end of the day, we're going to look at the f changing fashion in the styles of frames over the years. I also hope during the lunch break, as I've said, it's a chance for you to go and see our new spaces. And also there's a hand handout at the back, if you've not got already, which looks at the key treat treatments that we have done during our closure period. <coughs> All of these topics today have a golden thread. They look back to the past, but have a firm eye on, on the future. And that's exactly what we did as a gallery. And if it's that point, I would like to close on, if I may. Gallery's complete closure allowed us to view every single work coming off this display and out of our cases, a scale not seen since the Second World War. It's also a, a um, unique chance to send works out across the world on, on loan. We too have looked, looked to the future, and I hope you'll get a chance to see the portrait of Mai by Sir, Sir Joshua Reynolds, which hangs in room 18. This is jointly owned with, with the Getty, and it's a unique chance to research the painting through collaboration and par partnership, also to further un understand Re Reynolds' te technique. That is it for me, and I wish you all a good day ahead. And now I'm going to hand over to Hayley Tom Tomlin Linson of the National Gallery. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name, as Ed has said, thank you, is Hayley Tomlinson. And originally, it should have been Larry Keith who was going to be the moderator for this first session. You may have noticed that on the original flyer. But apologies to those of you who are looking forward to seeing Larry, but he has been unavoidably uh, called away. So I'm stepping in in his place. And he does send his apologies, but really there was nothing he could do. So in Larry's absence, I have the honor of moderating this first um, session this morning, this first segment in today's symposium. And the theme for this is how study informs painting conservation practice. And really, we're thinking about technical study here. Um, and we've got four excellent expert panelists, all from very different backgrounds, have very different experiences, work in quite distinct areas. So they're all going to give a short presentation on the theme. Um, and after that, there will be plenty of time for you to ask questions and for us to have a discussion. Now, I have prepared a series of questions, which I will, you know, just go through if nobody else has questions. But please do think if there are issues that you'd like to bring up or address, because this could be a, UK, a unique opportunity to have one of these experts, or all of these experts, to address the um, particular question you want to um, have answered. Um, so let's progress. And I'm just going to introduce, first of all, Aviva. Um, Aviva is a professor in the Department of Conservation at the Courtauld Institute London, where she took her PhD and did her postgraduate training in paintings conservation. She was a UP Loss Fellow at the Institute for Molecular Physics in Amsterdam, Netherlands, 2003 to 2005. From 1986 until 1992, she worked in the scientific department of the National Gallery London after a year as a conservator in Australia with the Regional Galleries Association of New South Wales. She has a BSc in neurobiology from the University of Sussex and she has published widely in the field of painting techniques and materials 
and aspects of conservation practice. So thank you, Aviva. Thank you. Thank you. So coming up the first slide. <coughs> So I've chosen just two, we've got six minutes each. I've chosen two example, examples of two paintings uh, for different reasons. And both are the work that involves painting pairs, which is a program that we run at the Courtauld. I should say that I'm an educator. I'm somebody who educates conservators and uh, introduces them to technical study of paintings and also practical treatment of paintings. So I've chosen two examples for different reasons, but both of them um, were worked on by pairs of graduate students in conservation and in the history of art, because of course the Courtauld is mainly the history of art and curating, and um, we have a, a conservation department for easel paintings and wall paintings too, um, for teaching practical conservators. So the first one is a Courtauld gallery picture, and I chose it because it's a version of the, the um, Salvatore Mundi by Leonardo. So it's been in the Courtauld gallery for a long time. It's a Gambia Parry picture. Um, it's now uh, owned by the, the Samuel Courtauld Trust, but it's never been on display because it's in quite poor condition. And quite recently, it came to the department to be worked on by a student um, who's called Megan Buchanan-Smith. And she, together with a partner in, in the history of art, did some research on the painting and did some technical research, which revealed very interesting issues about the conservation of the painting. Because, of course, before you conserve a painting, you need to, we think, you need to know what condition it's in and what you might expect to achieve. So the right-hand side picture is obviously the, the Courtauld Gallery picture. And um, as part of that, that conservation treatment she undertook, uh, taking samples and looking under the microscope. So on the top slide, you can see the blue azurite of the, of the robe, which is an old pigment that's used, might be used in, in, in the 1500s when this might have been painted. I should say that this painting came in with an attribution, a very loose attribution, to somebody called Marco Doggiano, who's, um, <laughs> are you laughing? <laughs> or you think not? <laughs> anyway, so, so there was no real reason for that, but it's a follower of Leonardo of some description. And um, typically we sometimes take small paint samples and grind them so that we can look at the layer structure. And here you can see a sample that was taken from the yellow decoration. Let's see if I can point it out. So the yellow's on top, and then underneath is the blue-green of the, of the drapery, and then under that a red layer and the ground layer, the priming on the, on the canvas. But more interesting, and to give an overview of the condition, we were able to do uh, macro XRF scanning, which now we have one, and most of the museums in the world have one. I know the National Gallery has one. Um, I don't think the National Portrait Gallery has one, but they use the National Gallery one, I think, sometimes. But it's a useful technique for mapping elements on the, on the surface of paintings. And here, what you can see is that there are elemental arsenic, which is indica indicative of arsenic sulfide, which is orpiment, a traditional pigment, which is used for the lining of the robe, a yellow pigment, but also tin, which is used for lead tin yellow decoration, which is also a traditional pigment. So this gave us the idea and for the highlights on the hair, and it's nicely mapped. Uh, so you can actually see where those elements are and they indicate these pigments. And both these traditional pigments were used around 1500 or so, so we, we think that the original painting wasn't a copy much later, but is, uh, is in fact a you know, roughly contemporary uh, copy or follower of Leonardo copy, or maybe even by Marco Giorgiano, <laughs> to be debated later. And I think from a conservation point of view, it was important, too, to map more modern materials. So here you can see a map for barium, which is indicative of barium sulfate, which was present in paints really from the 18th and 19th century onwards, so not part of the original painting. And pigments like chrome yellow and viridian, indicated by chromium, which is an element in part of those compounds, where you can see mapped the retouchings on the painting. So I think it's pretty obvious you can see not only the original materials, but where the retouchings are. And you can see that through a yellow or brown varnish, and that is really helpful for conservation. If you know what to expect, you know where the retouchings are that sometimes aren't that easy to see when you first begin to clean a painting, it's very, very helpful. And so that's my first example. Now, the second example is, uh, again, it's the, the, a collaboration between Becky Chipkin and Helen Cohn. Uh, Helen Cohn is the art historian and Becky Chipkin was the paintings conservator. And this is a, a painting of Praxitella, uh, which is a portrait of Iris Barry, who was the partner of uh, Percy Wyndham Lewis. And it was painted around 1921, and it's from Leeds Art Gallery. 
So sometimes we take on pictures from regional museums and uh, heritage organisations. And when I saw this in Leeds, when I first looked at it, there were, there were quite a lot of raised crackings. I thought, mm, maybe this needs treatment, but I could also see that there was something underneath the top surface. And if, on the right-hand side, you can see a little um, cracks where red paint was clearly coming through. You could see that there was something coloured and there were some textured things that didn't look like they belonged to the composition. So the X-ray of the painting, which was done at the Courtauld, showed this very complex um, vorticist thing underneath, which the two the pairs of students discovered was um, a, a version of Atlantic City by Helen Saunders, or Sanders, which was published in Blast magazine in 1916. So what was that doing underneath the painting by Wyndham Lewis? And they pursued this piece of research. And I want to give you this example because it's really about the history of art rather than conservation. It's about how technical studies can inform something historical. So what it was possible to do is to take one small sample and then to identify what I've said is the interlayer between these compositions. So the interlayer is this lead white containing layer. So everything above this is Iris Barry and everything underneath is the earlier composition. And then using, oops, yep, using macro XRF, the same technique as we used before to look at the, the follower of Leonardo. From the back, we were able to scan the painting and identify different colored pigments and the reason we couldn't scan it from the front was that there was this lead white layer which absorbed all the information. We saw absolutely nothing. And this, I think, will come up later in the questions about how you interpret these sorts of images. And you think this is magic, but it'll tell you everything about the condition of a picture. But actually, there's a lot of interpretation and um, processing that has to go on and learning about new techniques. So what you see here is um, the different colored. This is vermilion, the red things, a strange shape here. Or well, these are red, that's indicative of a red pigment, and the green pigments, and the green shapes. So we know that, we know that um, the painting underneath was a fully painted picture. And what we also know from their research is that Wyndham Lewis, was a, who was a well-known misogynist, painted over Helen Saunders' only coloured picture, only coloured painting. And that's where my discussion comes to an end. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> we're on that sad note. Oh yeah. Thank you very much, Aviva. And I didn't say earlier, but we're going to wait till the end of the four um, presentations to ask questions because the presentations are relatively short. So we're going to hand over now to Simon. And Simon Gillespie is a conservator restorer of fine art and an art historian. He is known particularly for his work with early British and Tudor portraits, although his practice extends across all periods from early paintings to contemporary artworks. Simon has been restoring art since 1978, having studied chemistry and undertaken two apprenticeships before opening his own studio in 1982. He has appeared frequent, frequently on the BBC series Britain's Lost Masterpieces and Fake or Fortune, so you may recognise Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Yes, I'm speaking from 40 years of um, experience um, and, uh, and how, th how things have changed in that time. Um, so a little bit of history, a little bit of um, what's going on today, but also hopefully what, what might be happening in the future. Not that I know, but... Um, um, the, go the days of uh, having good old-fashioned black, black and white books like this produced by a wonderful author who would travel the world to obscure places, to find pictures, and then put a book together at the end of his life, um, are, are virtually gone, because we've now got the new uh, things called the um, internet and our databases that are is so instant. Um, and I have full praise for the well-traveled art historian who would do that. I'm just showing you that as an example of how things have changed. Um, remember, we have our computers, our Google, our instant databases, color databases. And also, we, um, how things have changed as well. When we used to use these things, um, which you're probably familiar when you've broken your leg, um, and we used to put them together with uh, mosaics and squint at um, large mosaics like this, which were very helpful and very modern they became even more modernized when um, computer program came along and actually 
took out the lines and you could blend and uh, um, have a seamless image. Um, and we thought that was modern as well. But of course now we've moved on to having, um, to having uh, digital images for, uh, with an X-ray, which is absolutely amazing. And we can see very quickly underneath um, uh, visible images like this. Um, and this is a rather extraordinary example because it's got other things going on here as well. Upside down is another portrait underneath this Rumney. And we can zoom in to see things just like that. I mean, as opposed to having a uh, magnifying glass looking at those old-fashioned plates that we used to have. Um, this one also had um, an infrared image taken of it. And we found yet another portrait. Um, behind. You can see that there's a woman with a hat underneath the um, portrait of Flaxman, who is a, a sculptor and a friend of George Rumney. Um, and Alex Kitson, the expert on Rumney, has recognized this person underneath um, from an earlier, obviously, an earlier portrait. It's another example. But there you've got three different things going on, um, which was quite three different things, three different images of one picture and x-ray for some peculiar reasons not picking up the woman with the hat that easily. Um, gathering information is not always, it's not always uh, complicated. Um, this was, a, a, a Picasso came in um, to be cleaned from private collection and we noticed immediately that there was a very curious dark line that dripped all the way down over the picture. Not unusual for Picasso, we thought. We looked at it carefully, and the picture was a little bit dirty. And, but we looked at this drip and thought, well, is that really supposed to be there? And with a very, very slightly damp swab, just touched it, and it became obvious that it was um, going to come off very easily. Um, and there ensued a rather well, nice smell of coffee as well. <laughs> so we could only assume that perhaps something had happened to it maybe in his studio. We said, so we thought a little bit of research, not technical, opened up a few uh, books on him, and we suddenly found this uh, photograph of him with his picture, with the drip. And we thought, well, that's the earliest known picture of it in his studio, probably his coffee. Did he mean to put it there? We don't know. But um, we decided to leave it alone and leave the image untouched. Um, for good or bad. So I'm increasingly asked um, for my expertise during attribution processes on all sorts of different artists, which is quite fun having to find out about them. And with my attribution hat, I am always quick to advise that I cannot attribute, and that, uh, as we know, that we can only um, exclude, or we tend to exclude paintings because of known dates of materials when first introduced. And this is a very good example, a rather nice Claude Lorraine. Um, but we quickly found that it had Prussian blue on it, which was made exactly in 1704. Uh, Lorraine died in 1682. Um, this is where scientific analysis can sometimes be, give a very decisive and quick um, blow to any attribution. And this was the first thing that we actually did to the painting. So, uh, it made a decision that we were not going to treat it, but whether that was be ignored in the future. And that Prussian blue was over most of that sky as well, so it was part of the original painting. We have to be very careful when we're taking samples or sampling pictures to make sure that they aren't actually uh, retouchings that we're testing as well. Um, I'm also working with uh, artists, no, with um, specialist academics who are studying individual artists we're working very closely with them, more and more so. Um, and I think the learning curve between us um, in, in the conservation practice and also in the art historians, as you're training people to do that, is actually increasing. And it's, it's wonderful to see us now being involved much more. Um, and we are, and we do require more information. And that's partly because it is there and available to us now. It's not always necessary. But This is a Rembrandt that um, belongs to the National Trust, and we were asked to have a look at it 
uh, it had lots and lots of overpaint on it. Um, and understandably, somebody, the, the, the expert said, well, it can't be by, or it was in question. So it was demoted about 50, 60 years ago. Um, it came to us, we pointed out that it was covered in overpaint, and we said, well, why don't we take off the overpaint and try and reveal the original surface so that we can actually take a proper attribution, take a proper stab at the attribution. Part of this involved um, a number of uh, scientific analysis, but um, one of the most helpful pieces was doing dendrochronology, which, uh, which dated the wood um, and also showed that this, this plank, this panel, came from a plank where two other Rembrandt portraits had been cut from, if that makes sense. Um, so it helped, it was very compelling to think that that was then sawn off and used by Rembrandt um, as well. There were lots of other compelling uh, points to compare with Rembrandt. We put all our information together and approached um, the expert um, thinking the bells were going to be um, seen, but they didn't. He didn't agree that it was by Rembrandt, which is really quite surprising because every, uh, well, it's another story. Uh, this is the um, this is the dendro report. So dendro dendrochronology is when you are actually are counting the rings and measuring the rings um, of a of um, a, a, the age rings of a tree of wood, and you can actually see, see whether there was a good year, a wet year, a dry year, and you can map those out. And they've been mapped out now probably over about four or five thousand years, and they're used very much in um, archaeology, um, and certainly at the period of the 17th century in that sort of area, we've got a very good map, very good database now of um, what we're looking at. So if we counted the rings of the plank, that this, of, this, of the timber that this paint, picture was painted on, we should be able to map out a good year, a three dry years, four, four wet years, and immediately you run that information along and until it suddenly matches, and then bingo, you've suddenly got the day or the year that, that tree was actually growing. And then if you take off a bit of sapwood and you take off a couple of years for it to dry, and that's when it, the painting could, the first dates when the painting could be used. And on this picture, the, paint, the date ended up in 1631, I think, which is perfectly plausible for him, although he does look a bit young. But um, another picture came to us um, for similar sort of reasons, a rather beautiful portrait of uh, Elizabeth Linley it was given to the Glasgow Museum um, as by Reynolds. The family looked, family of um, Lindley, the Lindley family looked at this and said they didn't think it was her. And it was demoted being by her, but it was also then demoted as being by Reynolds. It was put into the store and hidden for um, 150 years. Um, it featured on, again on this, um, on Britain's Lost, Britain's Lost Masterpieces, the BBC Four programs. And we were asked to treat it and remove the discolored varnish uh, during the filming and the reattribution process. The conservation treatments uh, feature in the program as a way to understand the artwork and its subject. And also, it's a part of a sort of um, showing what goes on behind closed doors, or not what were normally closed doors of restoration studios. Um, there are certain artists, uh, Reynolds is one of them. Um, who, as we all know, experimented, and he, we all treat him very, with, very much with kid gloves when we see him. Um, and he uses not only in, uh, linseed oil, walnut oil, but sometimes cabobia balsam wax and other experimental materials, which are quite tricky to deal with, especially when they're used all at the same time. This painting had a layer of dirt and very discolored varnish, as well as reworkings by the artist. And you can see here and the x-ray where the composition has been changed. She was resting her arm, her head on her arm, um, and it was a rather elegant um, portrait. And then he's changed her mind, his mind for some reason and taken that out. On analyzing this, we found that there was a, uh, a layer that on top of the paint um, which had a, with a very delicate glaze, which was slightly tinted. And with our tests, we could not be sure that we could be, we, we, that we would um, not be affecting these delicate layers. And we couldn't even find a safe way to remove that varnish from those delicate layers. Uh, certainly not within the time frame of the producers of the program. 
uh, we had the painting scanned, and uh, including the subtle 3D surface of the, paint, the panel. It was then digitally restored. And you can see, and it was a very nice example to, to not only have a very, very high definition image, um, but also then to show um, how it could have looked when it was clean. And it hung in the museum when it went back, uncleaned, but with its image next to it, printed out like this. We also thought in the studio that it was actually a very nice example for us to learn how 3D scanning can be used, and also 3D print can be useful. This is the area of the eye, where you can actually see, well, there's no color on it there's, uh, in the image. Um, you can see the structure of the, of the brush strokes. And there's another example here where you can see the condition of a painted, of a painting, wall painting, in fact. In the future, I feel that this is a vital part of the process of condition reporting um, for important loans of fragile works of art. And it's definitely the next level of, of uh, capturing an image, an accurate image. Thank you. I'm now going to introduce Anna, Anna Cooper. Um, Anna is a paintings conservator at Tate. She read History of Art with Material Studies at University College London before completing the postgraduate diploma in the conservation of easel paintings at the Courshold Institute. Anna undertook a two-year internship at the Hamilton Carr Institute at the University of Cambridge, after which she worked for several years in private conservation studios in London. Alongside her practical work, Anna was a junior clothwork fellow and later an associate lecturer at the Courtauld Institute of Art. Anna joined Tate in 2018, where she specialises in the conservation of modern and contemporary paintings. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk about two 20th century examples today. Uh, we've already heard one excellent one from Aviva. And I thought I'd begin by talking about Natalia Gontarova's painting Linen, which was painted in 1913. It's an oil painting on hemp canvas um, and was, was prepared by the artist. And what you can see on the left is shirts, collars and uh, cuffs, and on the right, lace, aprons and blouse, uh, blouse with an iron in the lower right. So it's depicting the hustle and bustle of a laundry. And so to understand a bit more about the painting, we undertook some technical imaging. This is to enable us to understand more about the materials present, but also the condition. And so what this shows are fairly expected results. What we can see in the infrared image in the center, which generally de detects carbon containing materials, is that there's not much drawing present or visible. And that's not because it's not there, but because there's carbon containing grays and blacks around the edges, as well as the presence of Pl Prussian blue, which appears dark in infrared. And you can see that Gontrovers used three different types of blue in this painting. If you look at the striped shirt, there's dark lines where the Prussian blue is present and paler areas where cobalt blue and ultramarine is used instead. And the x-ray shows us that the composition was well constructed and stuck to during the execution of the painting. There are no major revisions or changes, but actually what you can see from that is her paint application. So with short, direct brush strokes, working within the composition and drawing. And you can see that from the, again from the striped shirt, where there isn't an overall layer of white, lead white priming on the top, but rather she's left reserved for the painted lines that go between them, and the white's painted within those areas. So this gives you a little bit of idea about the painting structure, but of course we always look very closely at the surface of paintings too. So as I said, the infrared just didn't mean that necessarily there was no underdrawing present, but rather it wasn't detectable with that type of analysis in, that, in those areas. And what you can see in the photomicrograph is graphite drawing in the center between two areas of the blue paint areas, directly on top of the ground. And when you look closely under the microscope, you can see lots of evidence of this across much of the picture. And so we also took um, a very small cross-section, and for context, these are the size of a grain of sand. They're very small to look at the overall layer structure. And what we can see here is the lowest layer that's white is that ground layer that you can see peeking through the middle in the photomicrograph. 
And the, the lower, the ground layer, is composed of lead white, zinc white, and gypsum applied by the artist. And in this one particular area, there's two layers of blue paint, which you can see a bit more clearly in the ultra, uh, ultraviolet light photograph, with the cobalt blue beneath and then a thicker, darker Prussian blue on top. And then the very most upper layer here is a pale blue highlight. And you can see, hopefully, in the cross-section in ultraviolet light, there's a glittery quality to the paint in the lowest layer and the uppermost layer. And that's the presence of zinc white. And the, that is an important finding because when we look at the next slide, you'll see that parts of the composition really come alive. And so what we're seeing here in UV light is the different fluorescence of the materials that are present. So compositionally, we talked about the division of different types of clothing on the left and right. But what we're seeing here in the UV light image is a division between the top and the bottom. In the top, where it's X-ray absorbing and darker, what we're seeing is the use of lead white paint mixed in with her materials. Whereas in the lower section, the fluorescent material is coming from the zinc white paint that's been mixed into the materials. But also, interestingly, compositionally, what you can see is these art curves. And what they depict, which you might not have immediately seen when you first looked at the painting, is the soap bubbles from the laundry. They're a nice compositional thing to understand about the picture. And here you can see that Gontrova really understands the properties of different paints. She knows that lead white is dense, opaque, and covering, whereas zinc white is much more translucent and cooler. So she's exploiting the different properties of paints to create different effects across the picture. And why that's interesting for us is not only do we understand a little bit more about maybe how she's working and thinking, but also because um, this could have been misinterpreted quite easily to think that half of the painting was varnished, when in fact the painting isn't varnished at all, it's an unvarnished surface, and you can see that from the dry, chalky qualities in the detail on the left. So it can be very, it's very important to think about how you interpret your images, and my next example is another e example of that. And this is a fantastic work by Philip Guston. Um, Philip Guston painted paintings by pinning large-scale pieces of canvas directly to the wall and working um, f freely and applying marks to the canvas directly without a drawing. And then he responded to the marks he made on the painting and then built the composition around those. So he's working with a lot of energy, he's very expressive, and his compositions build as he's working. And you can see that in Monument as around the edges where the additional features come uh, on top of the sky paint. And he's an excellent mark maker. He really knows how to handle paint. His marks vary their intensity, their pressure, their angles, the amount of paint, their speed. And it creates such a beautiful range of effects across the surface. So you might think it's quite unusual that I then was quite interested in one very particular brushstroke in this painting, which you can see in the detail. And why I was drawn to it was because it's a slightly different colour, um, a different texture, and a different gloss to the surrounding oil paint. So to try and investigate that further and understand what it was and why it might be there, uh, we undertook some technical imaging. And here, you again, you can see this area perhaps more clearly in the ultraviolet light detail and the infrared detail, which indicates a different type of paint material compared to the surrounding sky paint. And I think... This is a cautionary tale not to automatically assume that just because something is dark in UV, it automatically means that it's later restoration. But it, could be, it can be quite complicated. So to understand a bit more about the nature of this brushstroke, we took some very small samples to compare the surrounding sky paint to this brushstroke. And what you can see here is um, the sample on the left is from the sky paint, and the sample on the right is from the additional brushstroke. And what we were able to find out through analysis um, was that the pigments present in both paints are the same. There was no visual, uh, no distinction in terms of what pigments were there, but you can see on the right that perhaps the distribution of the colour and the amount and the size of the particles is a little different. But more clear, and you can see that there's this two layers on the right compared to one on the left, but also that most noticeably that there is this darker appearance in um, UV light. And the reason for that is Gustin is well known for painting in oil paint. And he wrote on the back of this painting, oil paint on canvas. 
And of course, that's what we found in our analysis on the left. But on the right, this brushstroke is painted in polybutyl methacrylate, which is also known as acrylic. So um, to think about that, you have to think, well, was acrylic available then? And in, in the 20th century, there's a huge expansion of different painting binding medias that are available. Um, different acrylics come in at different times, but really from the 40s to the 60s. And Guston did work in acrylic paint from 1967, very occasionally on some of his small scale paintings, but up until his death in 1980, when he made a series of 26 small scale acrylic paintings. So the material is available within Guston's lifetime, and it was definitely present on the painting when it was acquired into our collection in 1991. So I wanted to understand a little bit more about maybe dating that even further and more accurately. And so the technical analysis had taken me so far, and so like Simon and Aviva alluded to, our historical research and scholarship is equally important to help contextualize what we're seeing. So I was able to find um, images of Guston in front of this painting from the SF MoMA show that he had in 1980, just before his death, with this brushstroke present. So not only are we situating the material use within Guston's lifetime and within his studio, but also this brushstroke within his knowledge or potentially with, within his hand. So I should say that the brushstroke covers a very small, tiny loss within the middle of it, not proportional to the stroke that's present. Um, but the reason it's important to try and date when that might have been from is that this means that this layer of paint was applied within potentially three years of the painting's lifetime. And the oil paint beneath might have changed di differentially to the surrounding oil paint. So investigating or even considering removing something like this could have implications for, for various reasons. It could be by the artist, but also you might then just be revealing a difference in the oil paint beneath that would be similar to what you've already experiencing. And this is a small brushstroke in a very large picture that doesn't interrupt your reading of the image, but it's important to understand a lot about the materials that you're seeing and why you might be seeing them. Um, and so it's equally important for 20th century and 21st century paintings to understand what they're made from and what you may be seeing. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so last but not least, I'm going to introduce Alex, Dr. Alex Gent, um, who is a painting conservator here at the National Portrait Gallery. And prior to joining the Portrait Gallery in 2018, she worked for English Heritage, Tate, the National Galleries of Scotland, and the Wallace Collection. At the Wallace Collection, uh, Alex was Paintings Conservator for the Reynolds Research Project and co-curated the exhibition Joshua Reynolds Experiments in Paint. She was awarded a doctorate from the Court Art Institute of Art in 2019, writing her thesis on repetition and replication in Joshua Reynolds subject pictures. She has produced a number of publications on Reynolds painting technique and is generally, currently, and I'm sure for some time to come, the Reynolds expert. And when I had a painting to work on, a Reynolds painting a couple of years ago, she was the first person I contacted for help. So over to Alex. Thank you, Hayley. Um, I'm just chosen a couple of things to talk about, really, in relation to technical analysis. And my focus is conservation treatment and how technical analysis can, and working with scientific departments, which is the luxury of working within an, um, a big organization, um, really allows us to make treatment decisions in a very careful and um, considered way. So as Hayley mentioned in the introduction, I was working um, on Reynolds paintings for the Wallace Collection. And this was an amazing project that was funded and um, allowed me to work alongside the scientists at the National Gallery. Um, and the first part of this process, I mean, Simon was talking about how in private practice often there's a deadline or a reason why you're having to do something. And this was a project where we had the luxury of time and the luxury of spending time with these paintings, looking at them, undertaking technical analysis, and then making decisions about treatment that were very much based on this. Um, and just to give one example of this, I thought I'd look at the portrait of Miss Jane Bowles, which of the 12 paintings at the Wallace Collection, this was one of the paintings that we decided to treat. And on first inspection of the painting, uh, using microscopy, close looking, looking in UV light, 
this, um, apart from the fact that it had a quite discoloured varnish layer, it appeared to be in quite good condition for Reynolds painting, especially the figure. There were some, obviously, some losses in some areas and um, a little bit of cloudiness in the background that was a little bit hard to interpret. But, um, and the other thing that I was wanting to t uh, focus on in talking about this is talking about medium analysis, because this is something that um, uh, there is access to, but I, the interpretation is even more difficult, I would say, in lots of ways than other types of technical analysis. Um, and in this project, I was very lucky to be working with Rachel Morrison and Oshak Roy of the National Gallery, at the, both who are no longer at the National Gallery, but were at the National Gallery at the time. And we were able to, me as the conservator and their scientists, look together and work out a strategy for um, analysis and sampling that would allow us to make very informed treatment decisions. So this, in relation to Miss Bowles, this is uh, the UV photograph, which is very fluorescent. Um, and the analysis showed that there was a, a varnish layer that um, uh, uh, had been applied in the 1950s, and we knew that because there was also an actual record of that treatment as well, and that this was a, a synthetic resin that had been applied over everything. So the analysis showed the presence of that. It also showed the presence of a little bit of beeswax, um, which had also been included in this layer of, of varnish to as a uh, plasticizer and perhaps matting it as well. But then below this, um, we were, uh, Rachel was able to take samples that looked not only at those top layers, but then to go beneath that as well and see what we were going to find underneath that. Um, and this was a, a more of a natural resin varnish. So knowing that there was this layer all over the this surface of this, we were able to progress with the cleaning. So I was able to work out a way that we could remove this AW2 resin and then relook at things again. Um, and during this cleaning process, we started to have questions about what was actually present underneath that AW2 resin varnish. And this is an example of the, the inside of the girl's skirt where to some extent it looked like a, pool, a pooled degraded varnish but actually in the cross sections and in the unmounted sample, I hope you can see that there's, um, well, there's a layer that fluoresces less strongly um, and also contains some pigment. And um, through analysis and through close looking, uh, we were able to find that this definitely was a glaze layer that was present. Um, and during the cleaning process, one of the other things that we discovered was that actually... Um, so I, I, after removing the AW2, Rachel went, went back in, we did more testing. And maybe surprisingly, one of the things that we found in large quantities was beeswax. And this wasn't something that we'd initially found from the testing, but being able to go back in after the taking off the AW2, it was really significant amounts of beeswax, which seemed to indicate it was actually relating to either the paint or an original layer on the, on the surface. And the beeswax layer in the cross-section is actually under these glaze layers. So Reynolds, in his typical working strangely way, has, just, has put a, a layer of wax on and then painted over the top of it. And this was actually replicated across much of the picture. And we know from technical records that Reynolds did use uh, waxes as a sort of varnish layer. And so through knowing this, I was able to stop cleaning at the point of taking off the AW2 resin, so, which made an amazing difference in terms of the, it had actually yellowed quite a lot in the 50 plus years that it had been on the painting. But we knew that at this stage, there was too much risk to go any further and we were able to stop that process. And in fact, Rachel um, did some analysis of my swab with the AW2 on it and the paint surface, so we were trying to check that we were getting to a level that we were taking all of, m most of that layer off, that we weren't taking off that wax that was underneath as well. Um, and that, that, that sort of like close monitoring of a treatment is a luxury that I think only exists within um, in the institutional process in general. Um, and then 
to come to the portrait gallery and one of our most popular paintings in the collection, which I'm sure you can see on display when you're in the galleries, is this portrait of Laura Knight, self-portrait, um, which is incredibly popular and as such is always requested for loan as well. Um, but one of the things that's been an issue with this painting uh, over the years is uh, there's inherent instability in it. So if you look at the, back through the conservation files, there's a constant cycle of um, flake laying, some retouching. Um, there was, had already been some damage when the painting entered the collection as well. Um, it's lined, which is somewhat unusual for a painting of this date, early 20th century painting, to have been lined already. So there's obviously been ongoing issues of, um, of instability. So at this point in time, and especially with the gallery closed, we decided that this was a good uh, opportunity for us to, to have a moratorium on loans to say this painting is too fragile, like um, some organisations have done with other paintings, and to say this is the point at which we don't lend it anymore and we try and find out what the issue is and try and work out whether this is an issue that we will be able to fix or whether this is just a painting where we have to accept that um, it's inherently unstable and therefore the best um, care for it is to keep it uh, just here at the gallery on display. So um, the UV photograph on the left is showing some dark areas, which in this case, from surface examination, we know definitely relate to overpainting. Um, in the X-ray in the middle, you can see that there's uh, areas um, where the figure's been left in reserve, but also in the background where there's definitely been adjustments um, made by the artist during the painting process. Um, and in the infrared reflectogram on the right as well, there's um, some indications of different pigments being used in different areas. And this um, examination of these sorts of technical images side by side, um, not just one image, but looking at these different types of images together, I think is always, I'm sure all of my colleagues will <laughs> agree, is a very useful way of finding out more about the, um, the painting technique and what might be the issue. So, um, yeah, and just there has been flaking in many areas of the painting, but it is primarily... Uh, focused on these areas of drapery around the, um, the naked figure on the right. So I should say that we're also, we're not finished with the analysis at the moment, but we were um, able to collaborate with our colleagues next door at the National Gallery, um, who, and they have undertaken some XR scanning. But as I'm sure will be discussed further, the actual doing the scanning takes a long time, but then the interpretation of the results takes even longer. So um, Catherine Higgett, the conservation scientist at the National Gallery, is still looking at these results and looking at them alongside the analysis that we've already done um, and trying to work out whether these areas of instability are relating to specific pigments or artist technique and having all of these different things together to look at can give us a more holistic view and try and make some decisions about preserving this artwork for the long term. Thank you very much to all the speakers and I think the presentations combined give a very, very good sense of the analytical methods which are currently frequently employed. I mean, there are some other techniques we haven't mentioned. We haven't mentioned hyperspectral, we haven't mentioned uh, false colour infrared, what else? Has anything else got? I think we mentioned. But I think most of the techniques that are used frequently were all covered really well in that, which was excellent. And in a moment, I'm going to open the open to you for questions, but I'm going to greedily ask one question myself first. I think we're going to speak at order, so I'm going to ask everybody, but I'll start with you, Aviva. So I wanted to ask, this is, I hope this isn't too provocative, but are we over enamoured with analytical techniques? Is there a danger that reliance on analytical techniques could replace looking? I think that if you, you've got to start with looking. You have to look first. You have to, that's the first thing you do with a painting. There's no way that you can learn anything without looking. And those supplementary techniques can only provide more information. So you always start with looking and there's no substitute for it. I, I really believe that. I think that the, you know, the, the best, the people who really understand paintings are those who keep looking at paintings and have some sense of how they're made 
without the enhancements of, of technical imaging. I think the technical imaging, you, you have to learn how to interpret them. Each method, and we, I, I noticed how we all use this terminology that we're so familiar with, and maybe not everyone else is, but you have to learn that as, you know, as a student. And you have to think all the time about how you're interpreting these images, but the looking at the surface and at the back of a picture and at the sides of a painting, you've got to start with that or you, you're nowhere, is my view. Anything to add, Simon? I totally agree. Um, the, we automatically pounce on um, making a, a, a report which includes scientific analysis for whatever we can get from it, and it's mainly because it's there and, we, and it's accessible. But is it always necessary? Not always, no. <clears throat> I think that actually, as you say, picking, picking a picture up, actually looking at it, you know, handling it like the artist is sometimes, um, you'll, you'll just come, you'll get close to it, and you'll understand how it's put together more, you know, become more attached to it as opposed to uh, looking at uh, images the whole time, which is only 50% of the game, I think, as well. You need to pick it up. You need to look at it, get personal. Anything to add, Anna? Um, I agree. I think close looking is the most important step that we have and the one of the most important tools in our toolkit is our eyes. Um, it takes a long time to look closely, longer than you would think, to try and understand what's going on. It might not seem obvious at first. And analytical techniques are tools within our toolkit, but they can give us one aspect. And our eyes can see the fact that it's a three-dimensional composite object. Sometimes the imaging reduces it to what is or isn't there, whereas there's so much more nuance. And so I agree that um, you can't replace looking. Yes, I can only agree with everyone, yeah, but yeah. I should say that the, that first stage of looking is also starting to ask those questions about what are the other tools that we can use to get information that we can't get from just looking. So what, yeah, directing the focus, not undertaking things that aren't going to give you an answer. And what, and that sort of directing everything also based on what do you want to know? Like, what is the question? Like, posing the question as well as just looking at the same time. Yeah, I think it's quite useful, isn't it, to meet early on with art historians as well to find out what the issues are and scientists, you know, what are the potential um, areas of interest for them as well. Um, I have lots more questions, but does anybody here have something that they'd like to bring up? Yes. I've just got one question. I was amazed to see the, the digital restoration of the Reynolds. Can that technique be used? I don't think anybody is doing it, but um, all of us in the art, actually, with the, um, oh. sorry, very famous <laughs> example. Um, probably, <laughs> Viva's probably better to answer okay, this. Very but famous one is the Van, Van Gogh. You know, Van Gogh. There's quite yeah. a lot of research on fading of red pigments, not, in, not necessarily in textiles, but in pigments in paint. And so the focus has been on Van Gogh because there's so much data on what Van Gogh actually used and lots of analytical information about the materials specifically. And then ageing studies to look at the rates of fading. So based on that and examination of the paintings, um, the Metropolitan Museum, for example, made a digital reconstruction of some of his flower paintings. And you can still see it, I think, on, on YouTube even. And what they did is a, an estimation. But that's not the first time. There's, there have been lots of applications, particularly in the Netherlands, of works of art where you have a digital conservation treatment where it can't be done, or even in places like in churches where, where there's lots of fading and, and loss, they reconstruct by projecting on the wall so that people can experience how it might have looked. But all of these things are estimates, and because you don't know exactly how much something you have a sense of it, there's just an estimate, so it's not real necessarily. And it's quite shocking, I think, when you see the Van Gogh paintings in the digital reconstructions, they're incredibly colorful, not the way we see them now. And it's actually hard to take, you know, when we, we're used to looking at something and you suddenly see something that it might have been like that. You, it I makes think you think differently. Well, think yeah, and I think that, well, no, it's not we've allowed it. I think that the things change, don't they, whatever yeah. you do. Mm. So it's cumulative light aging. But yeah, it's been done for a long time, but it's not accurate. I don't think it's accurate. It's I just it, an it, idea. Is it working on works on paper as well? Are they reconstructing the colours? 
I haven't seen a reconstruction of works on paper, but it's possible to do all these things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, easy. We did one for mm. the, I'm not a paper conservator, but the paper mm. conservation team, and with our conservation scientists did one of the Van Gogh paintings in our collection that had been covered around the edges with a frame and the red in the sky and the water had faded to white. And so there was a digital reconstruction of our Van Gogh show um, next to the picture, which was, an, again, an estimation of what it could have been like based on the colors that had been preserved around the edges and the degree of fading that had been visible elsewhere. But the, the quote from one of Van Gogh's letters, though, as well, where he says, paintings fade like flowers. Mm -hmm. So he was painting with an, some level of knowledge, like not exactly how far it was going to go, but that these were objects that were going to change over time. So I think that sometimes the question as well is like, what, what's the purpose of a reconstruction? Obviously, the example that Simon gave is much more about removing a varnish layer. So that's a tone, but then recreating something where there's actually been change in that colour sense is much harder to to be sure of exactly what's going on. Um, yeah. We don't repaint. Don't we? Conservators don't repaint faded passages of paint. Or, or they don't retouch, generally don't retouch black and vermilion. Mm -hmm. There's also that, um, um, the Roscoe paintings that are part of Harvard's collection. Mm -hmm which massively faded, but they also had a colour photographic um, record of them, and they were able to work out how that colour image had changed, and then they created a projection. So ev they were projecting it onto the paintings, a sort of evocation of how it had been. Um, but yeah, it was never a permanent solution, and also obviously light is slightly different from you know, what the paint surface would have been like. But I remember some the conservators saying that people were so fascinated by the, the projector being turned off that pe they would turn up to see it being turned <laughs> off. So it was that sort of yeah, what what am I? What's real and what's not in that sense as well. Thank you. Any more questions? Let me come back to the, the, the I highlighted the fact that digital imagery now is for scanning is now probably at its best. And I think that as long as the scans are going to be well looked after, mm -hmm. then those would be very good for our future. I think um, our old photography is proving not to be as reliable as it used to be, mm -hmm. as, it, as we thought it was going to be. So hopefully scanning will actually be something we can refer to as well. I want future. to talk a little more about the um, macro XRF. Is everybody familiar with macro XRF in the audience? Um, because that's currently sort of very in vogue, isn't it, Aviva? Very in demand. Everybody wants macro XRF. Could we go back to the, the images of that? And, um, yeah, we have got some good images. And they're very attractive, very striking images. All the curators want them. Everybody wants them. But there are some dangers. I mean, they're apparently quite easy to interpret, but there are dangers, really, aren't there, um, I wonder if you could speak a little about that, Aviva, the problems with interpretation and... Yeah, I think all new, in, new techniques that have been applied to for the first time require experience to interpret things. And also because paintings are complex, and I picked a really complex one where you've got an interlayer of lead white between the paintings, uh, or the underlayer and the, the, the water cyst painting by Saunders and the top painting by Wyndham Lewis. And when you scan from the front, you see absolutely nothing. You get no information, but you can see there's something there. So scanning from the back. And the reason for that is that the lead white layer absorbs all the information from the underlying layers. So interpreting that, but not only that, you, just like with every analytical technique, the, there's a different, difference of sensitivity to different elements. So for example, with lead tin yellow, you don't see the lead, you don't see the tin very well using the technique. And it's been, I've been doing it now for a year, about a year. I would say that's, you know, I don't know everything about it. And the processing of the images isn't always straightforward. There are different ways of doing it. You can extract information in different ways. And although we've, we keep trying, I don't think we necessarily have got it right every time. And because the paintings themselves are, are, are complex, 
I think with things like x-radiography, which has been around since 1895 or something like that, we're so experienced now at looking at x-rays of paintings, and we have such a body of knowledge. It's not like one year's worth of this new technique. So inevitably, as, we do, as the museums, we have lots of meetings at different museums, and we talk about the different ways of processing, the different sorts of information, how we interpret it. We'll get better at it. But of course, you know, it's science. I mean, I'm a scientist, I suppose, and um, I know that you might think something this year, but in two years, somebody will review that and improve upon that interpretation. So I'm not pretending we know it all, that's for sure. That's my view on XRF. It's very useful, though, because you can see the whole picture. It's very nice from that point of view. You can see why people want it. I mean, just to give you an example, we recently um, did XRF of a large painting at the National Gallery. It's a recent acquisition, The Finding of Moses by Orazio Gentileschi. And it is, I've got the dimensions here, 2.5 by 3 metres. But to do the XRF took one whole month. And that's only half of the story, because then that data needs to be processed and analysed and stored. So it's an enormous undertaking, and I think when the curators or ver whoever wants it ask for these things, they don't re fully appreciate always how long it takes. And it could actually have an enormous influence on the lives of conservation scientists, because instead of you know, working in the lab, they're going to be in, you know, in photographic studios or on computers. And so I think we have to think about how we're going to manage, and hopefully things will improve, or hopefully the techniques will develop, but at the moment it's very onerous. It would be music to my ears. I yeah. spent a lot of time in the photo studio setting up, and we, last night we scanned a painting, which I hope this morning somebody saved the data, a portion of one small painting. So you can get this much in one go, I know that, and it takes all night, it takes all night to do. So hopefully in the future these things will speed up, I hope, that we'll have new instruments that's, that work more quickly, and of course you have to have all the security that goes with overnight scanning, and it means the students can't occupy the room for photos and for other things. So, you know, it's, uh, all of that is true. Yeah, Absolutely. Lots of issues yeah. uh, which yeah. aren't immediately obvious. Yeah. I have a question for Anna now, because Anna's obviously specialising really in contemporary and modern works. And obviously those present a whole different raft of problems because, they're, you know, sometimes you don't have an idea, you know, you have very little idea what they're made from and the materials could be quite unorthodox. So are there, do you think you have more need of technical analysis than people are working on old master paintings? And are there particular methods of analysis that you rely on more than others? Hmm. Perhaps um, slightly different needs, not more or less, but different. And um, all of the techniques that are applicable to historic or old master pictures are applicable to modern and contemporary. But, but, but we would maybe use a bit more portable FTIR to try and understand the paint binders because that has a huge influence on paint solubilities. Um, and if we understand what paint's present, then we know the parameters within which we can work within. Um, but another thing that we have that's, I suppose, an advantage for us often is that sometimes we can access the living artist. And they're a huge, amazing resource. And in my experience, they're very generous with their time and their knowledge and their explanation about their materials. Um, and it can be very illuminating because they're working with new materials in unprecedented ways. And that is both the most exciting and the most challenging part of my job. Um, but for example, with one artist um, I've worked with before, they were working, it, so two paintings made in exactly the same year of exactly the same materials, but painted with very slightly different um, techniques, resulted in quite different surface finishes. And what that meant was that when they had the same conservation issue, we had to undertake quite different approaches for addressing these because of the way the materials have been used. And that's not, that doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong, it just means they're different. And in that case, the artist was really generous and gave us some of their materials that they'd used, but also a test painting that they'd used to practice their technique for us to understand a bit more about it. So not only are we putting analysis together, but we're also researching the materials too. And one of the things I think analytically that's a little bit different for us perhaps is that we would perhaps do more color and gloss, me gloss measurements of a surface during treatment. Because for um, a historic painting, a varnish removal is a 
is a significant treatment, whereas for a modern contemporary painting that may not be varnished, the removal of any surface dirt that's accumulated over time is equally as significant a treatment as for the removal of a varnish. So we might take more measurements, because we're working directly on the paint surface, of the colour and gloss before and after treatment that you might not need for a varnish removal because the varnish is um, seen as a sacrificial layer that can be replenished, whereas the paint surface obviously is the paint surface. So that's where it might be a little different. Thank you. Have you found then sometimes the information you get from artists a little bit um, uh, varied? Uh, <laughs> In my experience, they've been really generous. So um, sometimes they're, they're just concerned that there's a reflection that maybe the conservation issue is bad practice. And of course, it's just not the case. These materials are not always very well known or understood yet, and they're being experimental. And as they should be, that our job is to care for what's there, not to dictate what you should or shouldn't use. So um, I, I just fully embrace any of their experimentation and find the challenge, and that is fun. Um, but no, I, in my experience, they've always been very generous. When I first started going back to artists and asking for, them for their advice on how they, what the materials they'd use, they'd immediately throw their hands in the air and say, no, give me the painting back, I want to do it. And they sort of, I suppose, sort of semi-owned it, I suppose. So it would go back and it would come back a completely different painting yeah. from what it was before. <laughs> but also, um, we, had, we had an example of a Damien Hurst work. Was it, I can't remember what it was now, but it had diamond dust on it. We were told it was a certain type of diamond dust. We got some of that in a huge expense and then put a start, started a test with this and it was the wrong grind. So you've got a completely different colour coming off it. So we had to then experiment a lot with finding the right. There is the challenge that um, yeah. commercial materials change and formulations well, change. Yeah. So what an artist say they use at one point may not be the same thing that's available now. So yes, there can be those complexities, but that's that they can't possibly know that because the formulations are trade secrets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one last question for me, unless anybody else here has anything they want to raise. Okay, just to say that there is enormous public interest in um, these stories, investigation of paintings, and Simon and Aviv have both been on the BBC doing various things. And it's, I think it, overall it must be good for our profession to, to have this interest. But is there any downside to this? Do you have any comments on that? Is it all good? The downside is that um, it's, it, it makes it look very easy. Um, <laughs> Fake Fortune and Britain's Last Masterpiece is both admirable programs. Um, Britain's Last Masterpiece is more about the art, I think. Um, and we, <laughs> what? <laughs> A little bit more. Um, but we, um, the downsides are, you know, it makes it look easy. Um, um, the program's not really about our methods, it's more about um, the results um, and sort of the wow factor. Um, conservation um, makes us look like we can reattribute, we can't. That's another point I would say. Um, I'd love to be able to open my studio up to, or our studios up to the public so that we can actually see more. I was horrified to hear that you had to sign the, the Official Secrets Act, I think, when you were first in, was, was it? At the National Gallery. At the National Gallery, yeah. Yes, a long time ago, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Not, well, not that long ago. Really? <laughs> 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 it was the First World War one. <laughs> Before you were born, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you again very much to the speakers and for you, uh, to you for listening. And I think now we have lunch. Is that right, Ed? Yes. Lunch now until 2 o'clock. So, see you later. <laughs>